Hi guys, um, so let's talk about acute coronary syndrome and um, this is a great topic because this might be exactly how you're feeling right now watching all these cardiac videos and getting super excited. So let's go into ACS. S, excuse me. So let's kind of take a little backtrack and, you know, kind of go back in time to those beautiful days when you were a med surge student and we were talking about chronic stable angina and cor uh, coronary artery disease. So let's look at where we're at now, now that you're in complex. So effectively, everything starts with plaques. There's all these plaques that are in your blood vessels. Um, and plaques in your blood vessels are what coronary artery disease is. And not plaques anywhere in your blood vessels, but plaques specifically in your coronary arteries, of course. And what happens is these plaques build up and you can have what's called chronic stable angina. And what happens is normally like when you're stressed out, when you're exercising, when you're exerting yourself, there's a mismatch between supply and demand of your oxygen. And so because of this, um, we can get what's called chronic stable angina. Or in other words, when I'm exercising and I have a lot of plaques, my blood vessels constrict. Um, and because of that, I don't get enough flow to my coronary artery. So I get chest pain just when I'm exercising or exerting myself. So that's the level that you needed to know before this class. You needed to know, hey, plaques can happen. That's coronary artery disease. And if I exercise plus have plaques, then I can get chronic stable angina or angina that's worse when I'm exercising and gets better with rest. Um, but this semester, you're going to learn about acute coronary syndrome. And this is when um, there is those plaques but you're not exercising, you're not stressed out, but they have gotten so severe that they actually have led to a complete or partial blockage of your coronary arteries, which therefore leads to a heart attack. So again, we're looking at how blocked we are. With stable angina, there's these plaques that are present, but they're not causing enough of a blockage um, to where all the time I'm having symptoms. Unstable angina, um, what happens there is, you know, we're going to kind of get more in depth of how each of these looks, but, you know, effectively they're starting to be a plaque rupture. Um, and because of that, they're starting to be like very, very minimal, um, you know, ability for blood flow. So there's a partial occlusion um, where, you know, the normal things that in stable angina that helped like resting or taking nitroglycerin don't help because there's starting to be an actual blockage. And then there's a non-STEMI or a STEMI, and this is, um, both of these are a complete blockage. Um, but, um, you know, what happens with one is it's how uh, the STEMI is, it's like all of the muscle tissue is dying, whereas a non-STEMI only part of the muscle tissue is dying. So we'll talk more about that here in a second. It'll make more sense. So let's kind of, um, you know, look at this um, kind of from a broader perspective. So as a whole, acute coronary uh, syndrome is all about ischemia. And it's about when I have ischemia or lack of oxygen and blood flow to my coronary arteries, um, and it's prolonged or it can't be immediately reversed. Because normally, you know, like with that chronic stable angina patient, I rested, I um, took my nitroglycerin and I got better. With these patients, that stuff is not going to be the same outcome. Um, and, uh, you know, when we talked about chronic stable, the plaques that were in my arteries, they were stable, um, um, you know, before, but once it gets unstable um, or they rupture, that's when it becomes a real problem. Because this is what happens when I say plaques rupturing, I mean, I have all that fatty stuff in my coronary arteries. When it ruptures, what happens when you get a cut? What does your body do? It sends all of its guys and platelets and everything says, hey guys, um, she's bleeding, you know, fix it. And the same thing happens when a plaque ruptures. Your body responds and it sends a bunch of platelets and other things to go help and they form a clot. So what happens when plaques rupture is clots form. Um, and so when we're talking about acute coronary syndrome, we're talking about all three of these things. We're talking about unstable angina, non-STEMI and STEMI. Um, and a non-STEMI and a STEMI are both types of heart attack. And that's just important to note that, you know, there's a difference between having angina that's unstable and then actually having a heart attack. Unstable angina, um, it's not responding to treatment, but there's no cell death that's occurring. Whereas with a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, cell death is occurring. So that's why um, we definitely have to treat those. We're going to talk about it. So let's go to unstable angina. So this is chest pain that is new. It occurs at rest because remember with, un with stable angina, usually it's when I'm doing activities. Um, it's increased in frequency or duration and it takes less effort to happen. It's very unpredictable. Um, it's not the same like, you know, where before I could just take my medicine or rest and I would get better. 
once we get into the STEMI and non-STEMI, we're talking about actual damage to the heart, like something is changing. And you know that something's changing because you're gonna see changes in your ECG. So by having a non-STEMI, which means part of my heart layers are starting to, um, to die off, um, it is uh, not complete occlusion, but it's a non-occlusive thrombus, really limiting my blood flow to my coronary arteries. I'm gonna start to see what's called ST depression or the, um, uh, what do you call it? The interval between my S and my T in my um, complex is going to start to be low or depressed. Um, on the other hand, if I have a hundred percent blockage of my coronary artery, which is known as a STEMI, which means all the layers of the heart tissue are affected, I start getting what's called ST elevation, or sometimes like this is what we kind of call a tombstone. It's really bad. It looks like your death, um, your gravestone that's going to be, um, you know, uh, you know, when you die, um, you know, at the graveyard, that tombstone, like that's what it starts to look like in your EKG. And that's a sign that all layers of your heart tissue are being affected. That's a more serious heart attack. We're gonna to need to do something immediately. So like I mentioned, one of the big things, that, um, the differences between these three is how are we gonna treat them? If I come in and have unstable angina, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat their chest pain and their symptoms and try to prevent further damage. I'm gonna monitor them closely. And if not done previously, they're gonna go um, do a uh, cardiac catheterization in an outpatient basis. In other words, it seems like my blockages are getting worse. So I need to be evaluated. Maybe I need to have cardiac surgery, I don't know. But uh, maybe I need to have a stent place, something like that. But it's not emergent, but I need to get something evaluated because something is changing in my blockages and I could end up having a heart attack. So unstable angina, not a heart attack, need to monitor it. I need to make sure they're not having any active heart attack. And then I'm going to go in and check on those blockages through a cardiac catheterization and see what's going on. Um, there's also a non-STEMI and a STEMI, and these are both heart attacks. This is damage. So I'm going to need to do something about it. If it's a non-STEMI, I need to get to the cath lab within 12 to 72 hours of the event so that we can, um, you know, if there's anything that needs to be opened up. Remember, this isn't a complete blockage, but it is a blockage um, that's leading to some cell, um, cell death. And so uh, we need to go in and take a look and see what's going on and correct anything if it is, um, if the, it is this type of of um, uh, what do you call it, event. And so the other thing to keep in mind is, is that um, patients that have non-STEMIs, they're gonna come in and they're gonna be complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, like all the symptoms of a heart attack, but sometimes we're gonna see nothing different on their EKG. Um, you know, they can have elevations in their troponin and other labs like that. But sometimes this patient's gonna seem completely like, you know, like they're having a heart attack, but we can't see it on a piece of paper. Um, and so again, you know, we're going to still want to explore and make sure that there's not something that we're missing. We can't always trust all diagnostics to be perfect and telling us what's going on. So sometimes we need to go in and, or well, we want to go in no matter what and take a look inside and see what's going on with these blockages. Now, a STEMI is going to be the most serious type uh, or part of ACS. And this is um, where we're gonna need to get them to the cath lab within 90 minutes. We could say time is muscle. So in other words, every minute that we spend that, that, that tissue is fully dying. Um, and um, if not a cardiac catheterization, we may also in conjunction with that use thrombolytic therapy. So remember like for strokes, we use TPA. We can also use it for a acute heart attack as well if the patient qualifies and meets the criteria. So what is a patient as a whole with um, acute coronary syndrome, whether it's unstable angina, STEMI, non-STEMI, what do they look like? Well, they're having pain. Um, they may complain of shortness of breath because their body's using all of its oxygen to try to work on this current problem. Um, early on, they show signs of compensation like hypertension, tachycardia, but as their heart attack worsens and their heart weakens, they're gonna show signs of decompensation. So think shock and heart failure. Um, keep in mind that a lot of people present with heart attacks differently. Women tend not to have typical chest pain. Instead, they have like shortness of breath, fatigue, general gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, diabetics can experience no symptoms. There's actually what's called a painless MI that diabetics can experience um, because they have, they don't have that same nerve. Um, their nerves are all messed up from all the sugar in their blood. And so a lot of times they can have no symptoms or they might just complain of shortness of breath. 
Um, older adults, just kind of like with infections, they can present just with confusion and that could be their only sign that you're having a heart attack. And if I, if I have a patient comes in and all they really are confused, my first thought isn't heart attacks. That's why if um, when they're a certain age, I need to start ruling out any possibility, including infection or heart attack. So I mentioned some labs and threw out some fun names. And what I want to bring up about these labs is the most often the labs that they're going to order is uh, the most often lab they're going to order is a troponin. And this shows cardiac death, you know, within a few hours. But the only downside of it is it stays elevated for a few weeks. And even though, um, you know, usually when I come in with a heart attack, I just have the one heart attack. If I have a lot of risk factors, most of the time, if one of my coronary arteries is blocked and other ones on the way to getting there. So troponin can tell me if I'm having an active heart attack right now. Um, but it's going to stay elevated for a while. So if I end up having a heart attack and then another one of my coronary arteries, the coronary arteries gets blocked, a troponin can't tell me whether I'm having an active heart attack because um, what do you call it? Um, it still may still be elevated from that initial um, first heart attack that I had. So we also have a lab called CKMB. And what this is going to tell me is if I'm having new cardiac damage. It takes um, <clears throat> a little bit longer to actually show up. <coughs> excuse me, um, but um, once it um, shows up, it goes away pretty quickly. So in other words, um, if I'm having a heart attack um, and I check a CKMB, it's going to elevate. But after a day or two, it's going to go back down to normal. So then if I was having a second heart attack within a few days of my first one, I'd be able to tell by using that CKMB. Sometimes we also check a myoglobin. It shows up super early, but it's not very specific to the heart. So we can't always rely on it because it could be a sign that there's um, cell death somewhere else in a different muscle in the body. Um, the, the overall, um, you know, because again, you don't decide which of these labs is ordered, but the overall takeaway is that we trend all of these. We want to see what direction they're going in. Even though the troponin takes a while to get back to normal, it still should be moving in the right direction. If it's still increasing, we're going to be worried. It should be decreasing. So emergency management for acute coronary syndrome is going to include 12 lead EKG and continuous monitoring, you know, watching that ST segment, seeing what's going on with it, upright position, um, oxygen, unless it's contraindicated, IV access, they're usually going to receive sublingual nitroglycerin. If you remember, we do that, um, you know, we do it under the tongue and we give them three doses every, like we give them one pill every five minutes, you know, and when they're at home, they do a total of three doses. I don't want to say that because in the hospital we have, we do give more than that, but we're going to give um, that sublingual nitroglycerin. If that's not enough, if their pain uh, is still there after using the nitroglycerin, then we're going to, you know, use things like morphine. Um, we're going to ask them if they took aspirin outside of the hospital. If they didn't, we're going to give them aspirin as well. Um, and then they're going to either need to get an emergency PCI or go to the um, cath lab to have a stent placed, um, that blockage open so we can restore blood flow to their heart, or they may get thrombolytic therapy if they qualify. And then sometimes they need emergent surgery. Some of these patients, they go to the cath lab and they go in and they have like three coronary arteries blocked. And so they can put stents in and stuff like that. But they, most of the time, what they really need to do is they need to have open heart surgery and have a cabbage done. So speaking of which, a cabbage, which is also known as a coronary artery bypass graft, um, if there's blockages to multiple coronary arteries, or if they cannot, when they try to go in and put a stent in or a balloon open the coronary arteries, if it's not working, sometimes we need to replace the coronary arteries. So effectively what we do is we take a graft, which is like another blood vessel from the leg. We can take them from the wrist. We can take them, um, we can use the one from your mammary artery in your chest, that's already in your chest. Um, and we uh, pretty much create brand new coronary arteries to um, supply and we bypass where the blockage is. So we pretty much create a new circuit. So kind of think of it like creating a detour so that we can get blood um, to your uh, coronary arteries. Um, and so um, it's a very serious surgery. It's very painful. Um, and so um, they literally have to cut down the center of your chest. And so uh, it definitely, there's a lot of complications. So as the nurse, if you're taking care of a patient who's had this, you have to, um, you know, there's a lot of monitoring that's required. So overall, um, the role of the nurse for acute coronary syndrome is I want to keep adequate coronary perfusion. Of course, I want my beautiful heart to be perfused. Uh, I need to manage their pain, uh, make sure that they're getting adequate oxygenation and tissue perfusion, and try to prevent complications. And there's a lot of cases that can happen, complications that can happen from a myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome like pericarditis, uh, heart failure, 
um, heart, other heart diseases, cardiomyopathies and things like that as well can um, arise over time from damage. Because again, this is cell death. Um, when we're getting all the way, if we're talking about myocardial infarctions, that's cell death. Um, and so um, and when the cells start to die, the muscle and pump gets weaker and everything starts going wrong. Um, I'm, it's also my Joel, uh, Joel, uh, job to monitor for effectiveness of medications, uh, making sure that the nitroglycerin is effective, make sure they're not experiencing any um, you know, side effects from that, um, checking on their pain and things like that as well. If they have a PCI, um, they're going to have a, if you remember back in um, med surge, we talked about um, that they have, uh, you know, this large catheter put in their groin so that we can access their coronary arteries in the cath lab. And so I need to monitor their neurovascular and their distal pulses really closely and monitor for bleeding or any complications from that procedure. Education is really going to be key for these patients. I need to support their cardiac health. And if they have a cabbage, I need to teach sternal precautions. So after that cabbage, you know, they cut right down your chest. I can't push, pull, or like, you know, like, how do we get up? You probably see me like wiggle around in my seat all the time. I'm pushing up with my hand. I can't do that if I have an incision because I'll, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a patient because it's so natural to push up with your hands. It literally rips down. They have wire internal wires and it literally rip, rips those wires because of the pressure. So um, they can completely rip um, that incision and um, need to go back. I've actually had to see people get their chest plated um, to keep it closed because of, um, you know, ripping that open. So we have to teach them, how do you use just your leg strength? And go ahead and try it after this video. See if you can stand, and I, a lot of y'all are young, so maybe you can do it, but, you know, see how well you can go around, try to do tasks like stand up from a sitting position or try to lay in your bed and then stand up without using your arms. Um, you know, you can't use your arms at all. So yeah, it's definitely a different, uh, whole different ball games. They have to learn sternal precautions. Um, and then you always want to remember when your patient comes in and has had a heart attack, what are the signs that they came in with? We want to always monitor for signs of reocclusion. So if I had a heart attack and I came in and I was having jaw pain, um, arm, shoulder pain and chest pain, if that starts happening again, that's usually a sign that I have reocclusion of that same place I had a problem in the first place. So I always need to be monitoring for signs of their going back and um, reoccluding because stents can close even after they're placed, um, you know, blockages form again. So I always need to be keeping an eye out to see, you know, was this effective or are they going back to um, having the same problems they were having before? Um, as a whole, cardiac health is important. Managing their blood pressure, no uh, smoking, staying away from that. Um, eating healthy, you know, cardiac rehab may be needed, watching their cholesterol levels, managing their diabetes if they have it, preventing diabetes and losing weight is key. So yeah, that is acute coronary syndrome. I hope this helped and I'll see you next time.